today's video we'll be looking at the AMD 386DX 40 MHz build. Alright, so today's video I put together a computer. This computer is based around the famous AMD 386DX 40 MHz, which is the fastest 386 processor. Um, I didn't do necessarily a period correct build uh, very strictly, but the parts and the setup, it's roughly, you know, from the early 90s. So, you know, 92, 93, 94. Uh, around that uh, era. So it is kind of period correct, but it is also kind of not. I, I wasn't very strict with it at all. Um, but yeah, from around the early 90s. Um, yeah, we're going to get right into it pretty quick here and talk about the parts and stuff. But the first thing is, uh, this case, this wasn't really my first choice for a case to use for this build, but it, it's kind of what I had. There's some issues with it. Uh, I could clean it up a little bit more, which I just realized there's some extra scuffs on it I didn't notice, so I'll probably do that. But uh, the megahertz LED uh, display right here, it, it doesn't work at all, uh, despite everything I try. just cannot get that thing to light up. Um, some of the covers were missing. Obviously, this one's a little different. It bulges a little. Colors off. This one's completely wrong, but it was the only spare one I had that like fit nicely in here. And it does kind of look neat. It does give this case kind of a neat look, although it, it's not correct, obviously. Um, the metal, I don't know what you want to call it, carrier that, that uh, sits behind these uh, three and a half inch uh, bays is missing, so I actually can't use either of these. Uh, I don't have a cool sticker to put here that I can uh, pretty easily remedy in the future. I'll probably get like a 386 sticker off uh, Geek and Spiel or something to put there. But other than that, yeah, uh, not really my first choice for a case, but yeah, overall it's not too bad. I guess it looks the part sort of early uh, 90s beige tower. Alright, so with that out of the way, let's get into this build. And this here is the motherboard I'll be using for this project. This is the MSI 3124. It is a uh, CONTAC, I believe that's how you pronounce it, uh, board. And here's uh, two CONTAC chips, but it also has a SIS chipset right here. If this board looks familiar, that is because I have used this before. Uh, this board is the same board I used in my eight-year-old video, Anatomy of a 386 PC. Of course, in that machine, it was clocked at 20 megahertz. We're going all out with the uh, 40 megahertz this time with this same board. Uh, but yeah, this that was an old video that featured this board. I also had a write-up on the blog featuring this board in Anatomy of a 386. Man, my production values, you know, eight years is a long time. You'd think my production values would be, like, way better. They haven't really improved that much, but I'll tell you this. It was even hard watched for me to watch that eight-year-old video just... Hmm. Anyway, so uh, let's take a look at this board. This is an interesting board. Uh, this is a pure, sort of pure 386 board. It's not one of those dual uh, 386 slash 486 boards. You can't install a 486 in the processor slot, sort of. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but this is a kind of an interesting board here. Um, standard AT, of course. Uh, you can't see it, but it's version 2.1. 2 8-bit and 6 16-bit ISA slots, so uh, all we need there. Of course, as I said earlier, there's a SIS uh, chip right here, and then we have these two CONTAC uh, chips right here. There is L2 cache on this board, and I believe I have it maxed at 256K of L2 cache. That should speed things up nicely. Uh, right here we have our math coprocessor. This can either take a standard 387 uh, math coprocessor or a WeTech uh, math coprocessor. So the math coprocessor that I have installed here, this is a Cyrix uh, 87DLC math coprocessor chip. Uh, apparently from what I've read it is quite fast. I don't know a whole lot about this chip though. Uh, it is rated at 33 megahertz, whereas our system is going to be going at uh, 40 megahertz. But I've never had an issue with this in the past, and I have used this board uh, quite extensively. 
Uh, I have used it even quite a bit at 40 megahertz and never had an issue. So, uh, yeah, that is our FPU. Of course, the CPU we're going with is the famous AMD 3D6DX at 40 megahertz. This is about, uh, yeah, this is as fast as you get with a 4D6. These were very popular when they came out. Uh, Intel themselves only went so high as a 33 megahertz uh, 386. So yeah, AMD kicked it up a notch with the 40 megahertz. So uh, this is the cream of the crop, more or less, when it comes to 386 CPUs. Now, you may notice something interesting about this socket here, and that's another little interesting thing about this particular motherboard, is there are extra pins here. Now that is interesting because this motherboard supports some pretty bizarre CPUs. Uh, one of the CPUs it does support is the Chips and Technologies Super 386. Now it is quite a rare CPU. I, I don't have one to test it out. I, I would recommend there's a YouTuber that does uh, vintage computer uh, YouTube videos. His name is High Treason and he did a video talking about the Super 386. You should check that out. And another uh, even more interesting thing about this board with the extra uh, holes right here for extra pins, uh, this board also officially supports the Chips and Technologies 3D605DX Super 386. Now, if you've never heard of either of those CPUs, that's quite understandable. They're quite obscure. But apparently the 3D605DX is so rare, we're not even sure it even exists or it was even sold. Uh, the manual for this motherboard does specifically state that it supports this CPU, although I've never saw one, and again, I'm not even sure it was officially ever released. Uh, it is possible that this board was made compatible with it, and the idea that um, maybe the, they thought the chip would be released, and then it wasn't, uh, and it was just too expensive to kind of go back and pull off the socket and put in a regular one. Or maybe the CPU was released and there's some floating around out there somewhere. I have no idea, but this board officially supports it. Also, i seen in the manual, it also interestingly supports a 486 upgrade daughter board. So, even though you cannot stick a 486 right in this socket, apparently there's a special, probably proprietary 486 upgrade daughter board. And I... Don't know if it would go into one of the ISA slots, but I think the, the manual suggests that it actually goes in the socket here, which is interesting. So, uh, and no, I do not have that upgrade, uh, unfortunately. Uh, right here we have the oscillator crystal. Uh, you can see the little, little plastic uh, thing holding it in. I cut that because at one point I had removed this to put in a 20 megahertz oscillator here because I wanted to run this at 20 megahertz. Uh, I have removed that, and now we have an 80 megahertz uh, crystal oscillator here. So, with these, a lot of these 386 boards, they'll have this crystal oscillator. And you look at the number on there, and you cut it in half, and that is what speed your CPU runs at. So, we are running at the full uh, 40 megahertz here. Uh, RAM, I believe the max this motherboard supports is 32 megabytes. I I'm actually considering just maxing the dang thing out at uh, 32 um megabytes which is again kind of ludicrous for this machine but I mean why not uh, I don't think it will negatively affect anything uh, but although I'm not sure that with the cache and stuff so I don't know I might just leave it at 16 megabytes uh, again that is more than enough and uh, standard 30 pin uh, RAM modules it accepts here and there are eight uh, I don't know what we call these sockets or slots for uh, memory expansion. So for a video card, I'm going with probably the obvious choice for a higher end build uh, with 16-bit ISA slots. I'm going for the renowned uh, Sang Labs ET4000 in ISA format. These, all, these cards with this chip also come in a VLB format. Uh, these are some of the fastest video cards you can get uh, in ISA and the VLB uh, format. So uh, this specific one is from Diamond Computer Systems. It's a Speedstar uh, with the Sang Labs ET4000. Uh, you can find these in different I, uh, from different makes uh, that use the same chip. Some of the cards are longer. Uh, this is one of the shorter, uh, more compact cards actually uh, of this type. Uh, full one megabyte of video memory, probably more than we'll need for even a high-end 386. 
And uh, yeah, these are known as being very fast cards, maybe even the fastest overall in um, in DOS. Uh, I've benched a few cards that uh, in some tests have been a little faster than this guy, but maybe it is the fastest overall. Overall, extremely compatible video card and very fast. Uh, this should be more than fast enough for our build. Now for sound, this might be a little surprising. I decided to go with something a little bit different here. Kind of my go-to card for 386s and even some 486 cards is usually the Sound Blaster Pro 2. I decided to go something a little bit different here, and this is actually a Aztec um, NX Pro, Sound Galaxy NX Pro Extra, something, Sound Galaxy Pro 16 Extra, I think this card is. Um, this one's branded with Ravel SC400, uh, but it is an Aztec card. Uh, in the past, I've generally stayed away from Aztec cards because growing up, I usually found them in Packard Bells, so I just assumed they were kind of garbage. Uh, but recently talking to people and doing a little research, they can actually be quite good. Now this one here, you probably can't see it, uh, but down in the bottom here, it is model SNB12. So this is a first gen card. It is 16 bit and it is later, but it uses the first gen chips. So those are usually the ones you want to look out for. The problem is most of these first gen chips actually have a kind of a neat thing where they'll actually support a Kovacs speech thing and the Disney sound source. Unfortunately, of all the Gen 1 sound cards, uh, I believe this is the only one that doesn't support those two standards. Otherwise, it does support, I believe, Sound Blaster Pro and Sound Blaster Pro 2 Windows Sound System. If you look right here, it has a real uh, Yamaha OPL FM chip. So, uh, it is Sound Blaster compatible, as I said, and, it, you know, it's a, it, it should be a pretty nice card. Now, would this card be more at home maybe in a 486 system? Uh, maybe like a DX266 or something like that. Uh, yeah, probably, but uh, it shouldn't do too bad in our high-end 386 system. Now, this card came out in 1994. Uh, our 386 system, I'm not really going for any kind of strict period correct time frame, but it is shooting for around 92 uh, to 93, so this card might be a little bit later than what we would expect to put in to a 386, but... Uh, I haven't played around with these before, and it is a first-gen uh, Aztec Sound Galaxy, so I want to check it out. Uh, I think these are two. These are not IDE. These are proprietary uh, for proprietary CD drive connections. Um, I think one of them's like Mits, Mish, Mishi, I'm, I can't I can never pronounce that one. Uh, Mitsumi, I believe it's pronounced. So this is for a Mitsumi con uh, CD drive connection, and this one's for Panasonic. Um, other than that, I believe there's actually a wavetable header on here, and, and and we do have line in, mic, line out, speaker, and we do have a game port slash uh, MIDI port right there. So, uh, I'm interested in trying out this card. Like I said, growing up, I always thought they were kind of like garbage cards, but I've actually heard that they're pretty nice, especially the early first-gen stuff. It's just a bummer this one probably doesn't support the speech thing uh, or the Disney sound source. But then again, how many games out there uh, support Kovox or Disney Sound Source and don't support Sound Blaster or AdLib? Uh, there might be a few, but uh, so I don't know how useful that feature is, but it would be neat to have. Uh, I might just test it anyways because information on if this specific card supports that is kind of sketchy uh, anyways. It's, it's not very clear, so maybe we'll do some testing and find out. So again, uh, I'm putting this thing together, put some cards in there. Uh, this case, unfortunately, it's not in the best shape. It's what I have available at the moment, but uh, the LED, there should be like a display here for the megahertz. Uh, I always love those on these old cases. Unfortunately, I just cannot get the thing to, to light up or display at all. I've, I've tried all kinds of things, and uh, these are all, you know, there's not necessarily a standard for these. Um, so, like, what works for one might not work for this display. And I don't know. I just haven't got it to uh, light up. It, it, it may be dead. Uh, the other lights seem to work. Power light and all that stuff. Um, the other problem is there should be, a like, a metal bracket that would go connect here. And it would allow me to mount, like, hard drives and a zip drive or, of course, a 1.44 megabyte floppy drive for these 
three and a half inch bays here, but in on this case it is missing. Um, so I am limited to three, five and a quarter inch bays here, which I think I can make work, but it's not ideal. Um, but you know, whatever. Um, the other thing I have to note is, and this is useful for working with these old boards, I could not, initially I couldn't get my video card to work, and that is because uh, the your jumpers, let's see, I think are these two right here, and then there's a jumper over here that control the speed of the ISA bus. Um, right now, it's the cards are working. Um, it, it is now running asynchronously at 7.2 megahertz, and I believe that's correct. I, I forget what the, I think that might be the official speed of ISA, uh, that or 8 megahertz, I can't quite remember, but that's within the range. Just would not post at all, or it would beep and give an error. So, just keep in mind, if you're having video card problems, uh, check what your uh, ISA uh, bus is running at, because some cards, just their tolerances are a little different. Uh, once I have this thing up and running, I might play around with those settings and um, see if I can overclock the bus. So despite being kind of a later 386 board, the BIOS in this thing was being a little bit picky with the like IDE hard drives, and I was just having a hard time getting an IDE uh, drive running. Although it could have just been the drives I was trying just weren't good. Uh, a lot of these IDE drives are uh, showing their age, but you know what? This is kind of a higher end build, so we're just going to go with SCSI. Uh, this isn't anything special, just a 16-bit ISA. I think it's an Adaptech card, and it will be functioning as my hard drive and uh, floppy drive controller. So we do have uh, have the hard drive up here. I believe it's a one gig drive. And then we have the uh, SCSI CD drive right here. So yeah, so far uh, it's working nicely. All right, so I just upgraded the RAM to a full, if we look over here, full uh, 32 megabytes. So we went from 16 to 32. Uh, ridiculous memory overkill for any 386, even a 40 megahertz one, but yeah, you know, why not? We can, so why not? Um, I, I have whole bags of these memory uh, sticks and stuff, so sure. Uh, but uh, if you want, if you're trying to build something a little more period correct, I don't know, maybe stick with eight or 16, like at the max. 32 is just, again, kind of ridiculous overkill. So we're all more or less uh, put together now. Uh, everything seems to be working. It's detecting the hard drive. I do have DOS 5.0 installed, a little more appropriate for this machine. Um, and everything's going good. I did run some initial benchmarks, like 3D Bench. Uh, now in 3D Bench, I believe I was getting a score of like 15.1. It's a little bit on the slow side. There's a lot of good comparisons out there. Uh, that I can compare this machine to. 15.1 in 3D Bench is in DOS is like a little, it's it's in the realm of what this machine should be doing, but it's, it's slightly on the low side. Now thankfully I found a thread on Vogan's, and there's a Vogan's user called, I think, Donut King, and he has a thread about his build, which is a 3D6 uh, DX40, and he's actually using the exact same motherboard as me, and I believe the exact same, where is it, right here, video card. Uh, so I found his thread and his machine a really good comparison. I think he was getting 15.1, 15.3, something like that. Uh, so I did some tinkering. I went to the BIOS. I tinker with the memory settings a little bit. And I can get things a little bit better, but it, it's less than one point in a lot of these uh, benchmarks. So I didn't get a lot of good results messing with the timings of the memory uh, in the BIOS. But there was that thing, I think I mentioned it earlier, is there, see these two jumpers, where can I find, yeah, right here, these two jumpers right here, I think it's JP3 and 4, and then this guy right here, I forget what, I think that's JP6. Anyways, those in combination control the speed of the ISA bus. Now, I believe the ISA bus by default is 7 point something, or maybe 8 megahertz, that's just generally what it normally runs at. What I have it running right now is asynchronously at 7.2 megahertz. Now, that seems to be giving it some kind of performance hit. I don't know if it's because it's set to asynchronous or what, uh, but I did mess with these a little bit, and it seems that the best uh, stable settings I can get is a overclock of the ISA bus to 10 megahertz, and it's running uh, 
synchronously at 10 megahertz. And that seems to give me pretty decent results, and that kind of lines up with uh, Donut King on Vogens and what his speeds are getting. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go with that for right now. I haven't run into any like glitches or compatibility issues with having the ISA bus overclocked a little bit. It seems like in general uh, they're pretty tolerant to being overclocked to like 9, 10 megahertz. I will say the documentation for this is a little confusing. When you're actually overclocking it, how it reads in the manual, it, it almost seems like you're underclocking it, so it's a bit confusing, but again, that Vogons thread really helped me understand these jumpers and what they're doing with the um, ISA bus here. So I'm going to run it like this uh, and see what our test results are and um, see if I run into any issues. But for right now, I think where we, we are where we want to be. Uh, everything seems to be working, got the, the RAM working in there. We're running pretty stable and everything. Um, so I got the card working, I did test it, we'll, we'll look at that really quick with this uh, Aztec card, but I think we're ready to rock and roll. So I'm going to button this guy up, and we're actually going to take a look at a few uh, benchmarks and games. Alright, so here's the machine posting. I always like to uh, display the posting in the machine. It actually gets the DOS prompt pretty quickly, so SCSI devices. Alright, so I uh, didn't do a ton of benchmarks here at all. I wanted to get straight to the games, but let's take a look at what I did do. All right, so looking at this chart here, the red is the 386DX40, and the blue is my uh, quote-unquote like high-end 386 I built uh, maybe a year or so ago, and it's running an Intel 386DX at 33 megahertz. Uh, it's similarly spec'd, the different video card, it's like a WDC card, but it's it, they're within the same ballpark as far as how they're spec'd. And I just I still had the um, statistics from that machine when I did the benchmarking, so I thought I'd throw it up there for comparison. Uh, I actually don't have a, I didn't write down the mark for it for Doom for whatever reason, but anyways. Uh, also note, I could have run Doom in the low detail benchmark, but I was actually had an older version of the Phil's benchmark suite on this computer. Uh, but anyways, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not super impressed with the scores I got. I, I'm a little disappointed with my scores for the uh, 386DX 40 megahertz, but they are within the realm of what this machine and CPU should be doing. I, I compared it to some other uh, stats online, and, you know, it's within the realm um, of, you know, what we I should be getting, but I was hoping to get a little bit higher. As I mentioned earlier, Donut King on Vogans, he has the he was using the same motherboard and the same video card, uh, and basically the same setup here, and he was getting a little bit higher. I think his 3D Bench 1.0C score was like 16.1, um, so he was doing a little bit better, but uh, it's okay. Um, the scores are okay, and I mean, it's an old board. Who knows what could be wrong with it that's slowing it down or maybe there's a setting somewhere. Uh, I've even heard ambient temperature uh, on these old machines can affect performance a little bit. So who knows? Again, it's not doing horrible. It's just performing a little bit under what I would have hoped to score. But overall, not bad and generally what should be expected. All right, so let's take a look at those games. Uh, real quick though, before the games, I was able to find the Sound Galaxy Pro 16 drivers and install them. Overall, it was a pretty easy install process, pretty smooth, and I didn't have any issues with uh, installing the card. The one exception, and this is something I didn't notice till I got uh, all the footage captured and got back to editing, is uh, the volume level on some of these game captures. The sound effects or the digital sound effects seem to be okay, but the music is at a noticeably lower level. Um, when I do some more editing, I'll try to adjust that where I can, uh, but just keep in mind, I'm, I'm not sure what happened. Uh, if I had to hazard a guess, I would think it would be the something with my audio capture setup. Uh, I do recall I, I split the audio one uh, line to the capture and then had another going to my speakers and it sounded just fine over the speakers. Both speakers, um, the volumes were fine so uh, something must have got goofed up as it went into the capture device.
So I wanted to take a look at the original Wing Commander game, because it's well known as a very speed-sensitive game, so I thought it would be interesting to take a look at, and uh, I like the beginning with these asteroids, meteors flying by, um, I think they'd be asteroids. Uh, it's a good way to look at like speed, especially if you have a turbo button, and as you can see they're going by a bit too fast, and he, he's here I click the turbo button and they're going much too slow, so this is a game on a 40 megahertz 3D6, it kind of runs too fast at 40 megahertz and too slow usually at whatever the turbo kicks it down to. I'd say in this uh, this machine's turbo mode it's a little bit more playable. I mean it, it's a little bit sluggish, it's a little bit slow, but it is a little more playable than when you kick it into 40 megahertz mode. And uh, that's what I'll do right here in a second. If you watch the screen you can see the shots firing pretty slow. And then I'll turn, yeah, there we go, back into 40 megahertz mode, and it becomes like a plasma ball machine gun there. Uh, it's just much too fast, really, to be playable. Um, now, I heard at the end of this game, there's a lot more going on, and you usually need a little bit more CPU power, but I'm guessing even in the end parts of this game, 40 megahertz, 386 might be a little bit uh, too fast. Uh, but I don't know. Let me know in the comments. Now the question, can you play Doom on a 40 megahertz uh, 3D6 DX? And as you can see here, this is high detail. Um, I want to actually play the game because sometimes the benchmark uh, doesn't give the full picture. Uh, even if it plays horribly in a benchmark, it might do much better like in the actual when you're actually playing the game. And it actually does play a lot better than in the benchmark, um, but it, it's not great. Um, I don't know, is it something you could tolerate? I'd let you be the judge of that, uh, but it isn't silky smooth or anything. Now, you can adjust the screen size. That's one thing you can do uh, if you're in high detail mode, and that does noticeably help uh, the performance. The other thing you can do is turn the graphical detail to low. And I found at graphical detail low, uh, I find the game perfectly playable in full screen. Uh, in my opinion, though, it looks kind of terrible. Um, now I wouldn't make either of these compromises. I would just play the game on a 486 or something like that. Uh, but if this is all you had, um, you had options. Uh, so I mean technically I mean it's playable, it's just not the best experience. I've also just noticed the bottom of the screen there is cut off a little tiny bit. So it's like ammo, health, it's like half cut off. Um, again that's an issue with uh, my capture process and not the game itself. On the CRT it displayed perfectly. <sighs>
Let me in, you Darwinian nightmare. Was that an insult? Well, what do you think? I think I'm tired of fancy Dan College boys who use big voids, and I think you's better apologize. Well, why should I, you fat tub of lard? That's it, wise guy. Put up your dukes. Now, Rise of the Triad has a lot of sound options, and one of them is Disney Sound Source. So I wanted to try it out, and it didn't see it, so um, as I thought, it wouldn't detect it. Uh, but the game runs fine when you select a Sound Blaster or Sound Blaster compatible. Another game that has sound support for both the Kovox speech thing and the Disney sound source is Bloodstone, an epic, epic dwarven tale. Uh, unfortunately, I wanted to test these again and neither of those options worked, but again, selecting Sound Blaster compatible uh, worked fine. I tried to play X-Wing on this machine, but I kept getting a not enough memory issue. I guess I didn't have enough free EMS memory. Uh, I looked the issue up online and there was a suggestion for uh, a command line to put in a file. And I did that and it gave me uh, a lot of EMS memory. And when, when I tried to run the game after that, it just went to black. Uh, so I couldn't get the game to run and uh, I just didn't feel like messing with it, so I moved on. So this is Knights of the Sky, and I, I was debating on whether I should even show this footage because I couldn't even figure out how to take off the ground in this uh, game. Yes, I have the manual, and yes, I should read it, and if I ever seriously play this game, I will read the controls and stuff like that, but I was being lazy yet again, and I didn't, and I couldn't even figure out how to take off off the ground. 
Although, from what I did play, it seems like maybe it was playing a little bit fast on this system. Malcolm the Jester is broken free. He now controls the Chirogen, source of all the magic in Chirandia. What happened? This willow looks half dead. What's this? A big dent? Ugh, even the trunk is rotten. That must be Bryn's mother. Welcome, Brandon. Lastly, I wanted to check out the seventh guest, uh, and I wanted to, I tr wanted to try the Windows Sound System because um, this card supposedly supports it, and it it didn't work for whatever reason. It gave this horrible screeching sound when I selected it, and then in the actual game, yeah, here that's the sound. Uh, but in the actual game, yeah, none of the the voices worked. Um, and so the sound was all kind of messed up in the game, so I don't know. I've heard Windows Sound System is kind of iffy in their DOS with some games. Anyways, Sound Blaster compatible, it worked fine. So that was a look at this 40 megahertz, the AMD DX40 PC that I have put together here. Is it the fastest example of a machine built around the AMD 386 DX40? No. Um, looking at some other people's benchmarks on the internet, uh, this one's coming in a little, like a pinch slow, maybe one FPS behind some, uh, in some benchmarks, maybe a little bit more, give or take. but. We're definitely in the ballpark with this machine. Again, I wasn't going for the fastest uh, of this type of machine, so uh, I think we're good. Uh, it's been pretty rock stable, which uh, is pretty typical of these 386, uh, at least the CPUs. Uh, the systems built around them, they tend to be very like stable. Uh, probably a little bit too much memory in this machine for what it is. 32 megabytes in a 386 is a lot. It's pretty uh, unnecessary, uh, but when I was doing some tests and I reduced the memory, it didn't seem to be really affecting our speed. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with this machine. Uh, I could see in the day, you know, if you had a 386 build, um, you didn't want to fork out the cash to upgrade again to like a 46 motherboard and you had a board like this uh, something that would accept the 40 megahertz 386 chip um, again I, I don't know what the prices were off the top of my head for this chip but I, I'm pretty sure they were much more affordable to grab one of these uh, 
40 megahertz DX chips than it would have been to, you know, upgrade your motherboard and buy a 46. So uh, it would have helped you along for a little bit longer. And it certainly is capable of playing, uh, you know, into the early uh, VGA era. And that's especially true when we're going with like turn-based things or maybe uh, stuff like Monkey Island here where it's more like a point-and-click adventure uh, where you don't have a lot of crazy stuff going on at once. Uh, like we're getting into like FPS games. Uh, of course it can run uh, Wolfenstein just fine, but the, the question is can it run something like Doom? Uh, and really getting into the heyday of FPS games on the PC and we're talking about maybe, you know, the mid-90s FPS games. Can this kind of 3D6 handle it? And um, I think kind of the answer to that is kind of, yes, with at least stuff like Doom, but with compromises. Uh, so again, the benchmark for Doom didn't give us the entire picture because it was really abysmal in the benchmark. Although I have to say the benchmark suite I had on here didn't give me the option. I was using an older one. It was already on the hard drive, so it wasn't giving me the option for Doom in low details with the benchmark. So we were running that benchmark in high details, and it was pretty abysmal. But when we actually got into the game, it, it was playable with, uh, like I said, with compromises. So uh, you could either reduce the viewing screen in high detail um, to a point where it was playable, or you could play it in low detail, which in my opinion looked pretty bad, so uh, it kind of depends on your tolerances. I, I can tell you if this was all I had uh, back in the mid-90s, early 90s, this was the only machine I had at home, uh, and I, had, I got Doom, and, I, and all my friends were hyping up Doom, and I really wanted to play Doom, I, yeah, I, I, I would have played it on this machine. I either would have um, played it in the low detail mode, or I would have shrunk the screen. Um, back in the day, but th today, like 2024, if you're a retro PC gamer, I wouldn't recommend playing it on this kind of system. Just just get a 46 for that game. It's much more smoother, much better experience, but, you know, technically, yeah, you can play it on a machine like this, again, with compromises. Uh, so overall, pretty cool machine. I am happy with it. I would like to get a little, like, 386 sticker here. Uh, I think it suffers from the same issues as, say, the Intel 33 megahertz, like the later high-end uh, 386s. Gives you a little more leeway with playing some VGA games, but, you know, it, you are hurting uh, compatibility again with some older titles. This just runs too fast with, say, stuff like Wing Commander. You do have the turbo button, but that doesn't always help. But you do have options of, like, turning off the cache and stuff. So there is things you can do uh, with this machine to get it running better with some of those, like, older titles. But overall, decent machine. Is this going to replace my high-end uh, 386, 33 megahertz? No. It is a little bit faster, uh, obviously, than that machine. But uh, I think I'll stick with that one. Would like... I would like to get a little 386 badge for this machine. I, I would love to get the LED working here, but... It's just not, but that's okay. But yeah, it's been pretty solid. So let me know what you think about it in the comments. Uh, I'm sure maybe a lot of you watching this video maybe had a AMD 386DX 40 megahertz when you were younger. Let me know how you liked your machine. Uh, let me know what it was like back in the day. So if, like, if you had one when this is kind of was a newer CPU, I'm always interested in those kind of stories. Like what was your setup? Uh, were you happy with it? How long did you use it uh, until you eventually upgraded? So I love hearing those stories. Uh, I'll see you in the next video, and have a good one.